started, I want to pray for Israel. I just kind of even noticed in myself, you know, like when that um, conflict first started, I was praying a lot for Israel. And that kind of, you know, sometimes because we're over here and we're not being impacted every day by it, you know, you sometimes kind of start losing track of it. You know, and I just thought we really do need to pray for them because they are really under attack. And also I want to pray for the hostages. There's, uh, from what I can tell, there's, um, believed to be six U.S. hostages and about 130 Israeli hostages still held. And the ones who have come out have said that it's pretty bad conditions. They're not getting a whole lot to eat. Um, you know, they're being kept in conditions where it's really dark, you know, for most of the day. Um, this one little girl, they said she came out and she told her dad, she was like, haven't I been in there for a year? You know, so she lost all track of time. There's another little girl came out. They said she would barely speak. Like she would, you know, because she had just been told to be quiet constantly, so she just felt like she couldn't speak. Yeah. You know, so I just want to pray for, you know, all of these people. You know, and then also we just know that there's a lot of suffering going on, especially, you know, in Gaza with the civilians too. So um, let's pray about that. Yeah. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have an answer yes. to this, Lord. And Lord, we know that you are good. You don't want to see people suffering. And so, Lord, we are praying, God, that you would be with this whole situation. I pray, Lord, that you would cause there to be an end to Hamas, the terrorist organization, Lord. We pray, God, that that, that you know, that even, um, you know, the Palestinian people might even put an end to that. I pray, Lord, that you would just do something amazing that we haven't even seen or thought of or thought of how it would happen. Uh, but we thank you, Lord, that you can do anything lord nothing is impossible with you and so we pray lord that you are working in people's hearts lord we pray god that you would be with israel that you protect them lord your word says that we are to pray for the peace of jerusalem and to pray for the peace of israel and so we do pray for that lord that they would be able to be at peace lord and have the land that you have given to them lord we pray god that you would also be with every single hostage lord Lord, I pray that you are helping them, that you're comforting them, that you're providing for them, Lord. You know, if there's some way for them to get some extra food or for somebody to have a heart uh, to help them, we just pray for that, Lord. And Lord, I do pray that you would release them. Lord, Psalm 146, verse 7 says that you execute justice for the oppressed, you give food to the hungry, and you set the prisoners free. And so we are appealing to the Lord who sets the prisoners free to take care of this, Lord. We pray, God, that they would all be released, they would not be harmed. Uh, and we pray, Lord, also for healing from the trauma that they have gone through, Lord. We pray, God, that this also would be something that would cause each of them to find Jesus, Lord. I just pray that you would use this. You know, we know, we know who is the author of these kinds of things, it's Satan, but Lord, we know also that your word says that you can turn what Satan meant for evil into good. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use this to draw people to see Jesus, Lord. So we thank you for that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And we're going to receive our offering in just a few minutes here in the service. But before we do that, I want to give you a chance to give us a prayer request. And so there is a yellow card that's in a seat pocket either in front of you or behind you. And so if you'd like us to pray for something, go ahead and put a prayer request on there. You can place it in the offering when it comes by. And so we will pray for you. We'll also put it on our Wednesday prayer line. You know, if you don't want it on the prayer line, just write confidential on there. And we, then just Pastor David and I will pray. And so you can go ahead and be preparing those now. Also, if you're led to do an offering, now would be the time to prepare that. And so while you're doing that, I want to talk to you about the incredible greatness of God's power. This is something that I started uh, last week you know, just really kind of inspired by the, the message that Pastor David had for this year. You know, just those great scriptures about how God can do incredible things. And today I want to talk about the God who brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. Yes. So that's a pretty incredible name for him, isn't it? Yes. You know, and Pastor David was telling us that we've got to really believe and speak faith over a harvest of souls happening in 2024. You know, even if it might feel like, wow, how is that going to happen? You know, because maybe we haven't seen it. You know, I hear about the revivals that happened in the past, you know. Like I've heard about the John, John Wesley and how he would just go out and preach in a field and all these people would join him out there. 
and you know other revivals where they said that people were getting saved not just at church but at, on their job sites they said there were people working in mines like falling on their knees getting saved you know all these amazing things and i just personally have never seen that in my life you know but we got to believe for it you know and god might have something even more amazing than that planned you know he is a he nothing's impossible and he is amazingly creative he may have some even stronger bigger move planned you know for us and for the world than even that and so i want us to really be believing for that so that's kind of part of what i'm what i'm wanting to do with these uh the messages and so abraham is a great example of this and so i want to have us look at romans 4. Uh, we're going to look at 17 through 21 and kind of verse by verse so um, verse 17 says that is what the scriptures mean when god told him i have made you the father of many nations this happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. And so, oh, yeah, stay on 17. That's okay. <laughs> you know, it's just really because Abraham believed is what, what it says there. Because he believed in, in the God, you know, who brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing, that he was able to see that come to pass in his life. You know, and I just want you to realize that's the same God. You serve the same God as Abraham did. And that he can totally be that God and that name for you. You know, that he will bring, you know, anything that's dead in your life back to life. Or he can create something new where maybe nothing existed prior to that. So I want to encourage you with that. Nothing's impossible with him. And then verse 18 says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. You know, it's really interesting. His name was Ab Abram initially, and Abram means exalted father. So I just think about the fact that, you know, probably every day, you use your name every day, I would imagine, you know, or somebody else uses it to you, you know. So people were saying, exalted father, come here, you know. So I just think he was constantly having that reinforced within him that God had given him this promise and about a year before his son Isaac was born God changed his name to Abraham which is father of a multitude you know so one so God was really emphasizing like I am going to do this I know you have don't have any kids yet but I will do it and then uh, verse 19 and Abraham's faith did not weaken even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. So he received that promise at age 75. He had to wait 25 years for that promise. That's actually a long time to really be believing for something. And I'm sure, you know, there were times when it was like, wow, <laughs> how long, God? You know, so I just think it's really important. And faith really only grows in the waiting. You know, I think that's a really important thing to know is you gotta gotta have something to to wait on. Really, I, probably the most amazing things happen. You know, some promise that you have waited for a long time for. Uh, you will see incredible things with that. And then verse 20 says Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. And I find this kind of interesting because we know the story, right? Um, there did seem to be some times when Abraham was maybe a little shaky on that. Um, you know, one of the times was that, um, like God had spoken to him in Genesis 12, and then at about age 86, God spoke to him again, you know, and, and he said, okay, look, I don't have any kids, so I guess Eliezer, my servant who was born in my house, he's going to be my descendant. Is that what you're talking about, God? You know, and God was like, no, it's going to be a child brought out of your own body. You know, so he had that. Also, he had the, the lapse, I guess you might call it, where he and Sarah decided, we're going to make this happen. You know, and so she came up with the idea of, why don't I give you my, my maid, Hagar, and you can have a child with her. You know, so they even did that. But I just really think it's encouraging for us that God still saw him as having great faith. You know, God said, he, you know, he's the father of all of those who believe. You know, so I just want to encourage you, even if you've had some moments where you've kind of questioned or you've doubted a little bit, you know, God, 
just keep coming around to faith, and God will see that as you having faith. Yeah. And then Romans uh, 4.21, he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And remember last week, I did that quote from Marilyn Hickey about that God is working your entire life to convince you what is possible. Well, Abraham was fully convinced. So I think that's just a great example for us. And I just want to encourage you to keep speaking the promises. Get yourself some verses. You know, we mentioned um, that we had done the circle verses uh, for the church for 2024 that are up on the coffee bar if you want to join us in believing for some things. These are some verses that we feel like God has given us for this year, and we want to speak those things out. And the word will never return empty. And so uh, with that, we're going to receive the offering, and we'll receive the prayer requests. Uh, we are going to receive the offering here in the service, uh, but we do have some electronic ways to give if you'd like to do that. And I'll pray over the offering and the prayer requests. Well, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you do for us. And we thank you, God. You are the God you know, who brings the dead back to life, and you create new things out of nothing. And so we know, Lord, that there is not a thing impossible with you, that you can do anything. Help us, Lord, to really believe. Lord, I feel like that's where the sometimes the disconnect is, is, is that we struggle with that, Lord. So I just pray, God, that no matter what it is that we're going through or seeing, that we choose faith. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would help each one of us to speak faith. I pray, Lord, that we would uh, just really begin to speak your word over the things in our lives and over our families. Um, and Lord, I do feel like that there is something this year also with, uh, with families coming to know you. I know, we, you know. I know we have people in our family that we've prayed for for years, decades. And I know there's other people in here who have prayed for decades over people in their families, Lord. We are thanking you, God, that they are going to come to you, Lord. You know, that you are able, you raised Jesus from the dead. No one is too hard. No one is like too hard of a case that they aren't going to be able to turn to you, Lord. And so we thank you for that. And we pray this, and we pray, Lord, that you bless this offering. Use it to bring other people into your family, Lord, and be with every single prayer request. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lonnie and Derek are going to receive the offerings and the prayer requests. And so I have just a few announcements while they're doing that. Um, one, we've got our breaking intimidation study going on. Uh, this has been really good, and it was on, it's on the gifts this, this week, I believe. It's uh, part two of the gifts. So that's a great study, so come out. We have dinner at five, and then we move into the study. And then we've got a 24-hour fast and a one-hour prayer on Zoom. Um, and so Pastor David and I are gonna start fasting on Friday. And then, uh, then we'll have this on, on Zoom. If you want to pray with us, that would be great. Uh, we, we're kind of leaving the fasting up to you because, you know, whatever your medical situation is, I'm, we don't want to have somebody fast who has a medical need to not do that. Um, so we just say whatever the Lord leads you to do, do that for a fast. Uh, but we just know that God works through fasting and prayer. It's an amazing uh, spiritual warfare weapon that God has given us. And so we want to invite you to that. That'll be next Saturday. And then um, we have a safety meeting Sunday, January 28th after the service. Uh, this is, you know, for all volunteers. If you'd like to come and find out uh, kind of some of our safety plans. Or anybody. Or anybody. Yeah, anybody's actually welcome if you'd like to hear that. This is stuff like, where do we go in case of a tornado? If we had a medical emergency in here, what would we do? Um, you know, just different things that might come up if we had an overdose situation, what would we do? Uh, you know, whatever it might be. And so lunch will be provided. So I am asking that you RSVP if you plan to come just so we know how much food to get. Um, but that'll be good. Sometimes these are good things to go over so that everybody knows what to do. And with that, I'll call Pastor David. Did you know Abraham lived to be 175 years old? That is amazing, isn't it? Wow. I lived that long. Oh, you, you might ask God. Say, hey, you know, I want to live a long time. You know what? I want to be taken up at some point. I want to be up here preaching on the platform, and all of a sudden the rapture happens, and I'm out of here, dude. And I want you all to be with me here. So as we go and, you know, we speak your words this morning, um, 
that, you know, before we go out, we become Holy Spirit ambassadors for the kingdom of God, that we maintain our focus so that when he comes to get us, you know, there's oil in the lamp, amen, that we're light in this world. And in order to become a Holy Spirit ambassador, you just can't, like, receive a title from somebody on earth. No, there has to be a working, a regeneration in the Holy Spirit. There has to be an inward change. Amen? And I believe as God speaks his word into your life this morning, you are going to become on fire as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Amen? I said amen. Amen. Call now. So, in Titus chapter 3, verse 1 through 2, we'll start there. And Paul is talking to Titus. He's in the island of Crete. He's a pastor there. And it was a, a rough thing uh, to be called a Cretan because, man, you were coarse. You were full of sin. There was a lot going on there. And so this guy is called to this area, which even the Gentiles think is the worst place, okay? So though we think we have some trouble in our society today, Timothy, okay? He says, Paul says, remind people to be subject to rulers. You say, wow, I gotta be subject to rulers? Well, that's not a suggestion, that's really a command. And um, so as we look at the time of Titus and where he was at, man, you had people like Nero in charge, you know, uh, killing Christians, blaming a fire in Rome on Christians. And you're thinking, sometimes we got it tough? Oh, the economy's just a little rough? Well, it was more than that in his time. There was a lot going on with people. There was a lot going on in government. And he says, be sub subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient. But why? He says, to be ready and willing to do good. So that our focus is not on the kingdoms of this world, but our focus is on God's kingdom. So verse 2 says, to slander or abuse no one, be kind and conciliatory and gentle, showing unqualified consideration. They didn't deserve it. Christ gave us unqualified consideration when he died on the cross, didn't he? Yeah. And so unqualified consideration, this is a a minor task he's calling us for, okay? Now he tells us to pick up our cross and follow him, but our cross isn't as, as rough as his, right? So when we look at this and say unqualified consideration and courtesy towards everyone, everyone. Some people we think, well, I'll show consideration and courtesy to this one, but that one, man, they're a rough person. And that's what Titus was dealing with. Christians have objections toward all their fellow citizens outside the church, but by their gentle disposition, they can influence them for good. Amen? They can say, hey, do you know what happened in my life? Do you know what I could share with you? Do you know what? There's hope for everybody. And, and point one is this. The lives of believers in Christ are to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, mercy. And it says, in which there is no law. You know, we operate in the law of Christ when we operate in the fruits of the Spirit. Amen? And that's found in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 through 24. And you know that our lives have the fruit of the Spirit that is also having a testimony to others and even those in authority. I know we were called to, during COVID, we were called uh, a bunch of pastors to um, the state capitol when it was closed. And we were invited to pray over both chambers. And they started to tell us about who was in authority. And it would be shocking, the backgrounds of some of these people. And I said, pray especially for this one. Pray over this desk because this is going on. This one's a wicked. This one's this. One, this one's that. Okay? And we want to everyone to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? 
we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven first and foremost. And we're passing through the earthly kingdoms of this present age. And it can be rough going through Crete. Amen? It can be rough at times. And we face opposition, yes. But in Philippians 3.20 it says, but we are different because our citizenship is in heaven. Amen? Amen? We don't have an earthly focus, folks. We have a heavenly focus. And from there, listen, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. So then he says, from there, from that place where I've put you to look from my perspective and from there, we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. From that perspective, we wait. Amen? Amen. And Christians are in the world, but not of it. So we don't let it stain us. Jesus said, my kingdom is not part of this world. And as his ambassadors, we need to represent the truth to the world. Yes. Most definitely. And John 18, 36 says, Jesus replied, my kingdom is not of this world. Remember, they wanted to make him an earthly king. Oh, he would have been an awesome earthly king reigning in Jerusalem. They, they wanted that so much. I mean, the, everything was in trouble. They were causing people to have to sell, you know, buy doves and 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 pigeons and everything for the offering. They, they said, yours isn't good enough. You have to buy from me. And you know, the economy was crazy. There were people that were in control. It says, look at me, I'm religious. Amen. But God didn't call us to be religious. He called us into fellowship with him in a place, in a heavenly place, as we wait for him, in a heavenly position as ambassadors. He says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. So our kingdom also is not of this world. This year, we'll be called to rap, be, give our opinion about everything happening. Who's on the ballot, who's not on the ballot, whatever. My kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom is is not of this world. So who was Titus? We talked about it a little bit. Paul wrote the book of Titus to his companion who was tasked with visiting Crete, a place famous for sin. And we live in a city that is famous for sin. Denver is famous across the nation for sin and crime right now. Titus was to restore order to the churches in Crete. He says, well, you know what? Titus, they're supposed to live different than the rest of the world, the, the people around you. And so he was also to replace in the book of Titus corrupt teachers. They weren't teaching the truth. So discipline begins in the house of God. Is what he's saying. There's, there, there, this should, these things shouldn't happen in the house of God. The house of God is the kingdom. Amen? It's not of this world. The key themes in Paul's letter to Titus was Jesus is our eternal hope. There is the perspective. The power of the gospel in public life. No one can tell you not to share the gospel, amen, if your kingdom is not of this world. And it could be called the upside down value of generosity, but I think it is the right side up value that we're a generous people. Amen? We're a giving people. This year, I plan on going into some areas where we can really minister in places where we know that people live and they're saying, you know what? I'm trying to make a change in my life. I'm trying to live and operate in this world and I'm barely making it. And so we're going to go into some places this year where we get to share and we get to be ambassadors. Danny is an ambassador into the Federal Correctional Facility and ministers to guys. We all need to participate in being ambassadors for Christ. Amen? 
And Titus 3, 2 says, to slander and abuse no one, but be kind and conciliatory. You said, well, you already read that, Pastor. Yes, but we need to read it again. Sometimes we need to get it ingrained in us, engrafted. It's the engrafted word. Amen? Showing unqualified consideration and courtesy to everyone. How could Titus accomplish this? This is a huge task. It's beyond our normal scope of operation. People run us, you know, rub us wrong. But the problem is, we're down here being rubbed wrong instead of being in a position that we see things different. And so Jesus, on display to the world, Max Lucado wrote this, a powerful witness, this is what Jesus intends the church to be. This powerful witness shows the world to be transformed, what transformed lives look like. Amen? Not perfect lives, but lives that testify what is possible when Jesus is at the center of our lives. When he's at the center of our lives. Then Jesus, when he is at the center of the church, people with a diversity of backgrounds, serve and love each other. I remember when Orchard Road Christian Center was at Orchard Road Christian Center, there was all, it was amazing. There was a whole bunch of Russians that were attending. And what was is so great about that church and Encounter Church, and, and they partner with us, is there's people from all different backgrounds. And as we look around the room, there's people from different backgrounds, amen? different ways and walks of life, but we're all called not to be conformed to that. That's our natural state, but our heavenly state is a place of love, a place where we say, you know what? Christ's priorities are the important thing. What's important is what he has done in my lives, in my life. So prejudice and biases are replaced by love and grace. Amen? Peace, not conflict, is the goal of all our relationships. This is what was on display in the first church. Those early believers were, they had a powerful testimony of what was possible in Jesus. Nancy mentioned Abraham so full of faith, amen, that he believed God. This same possibility, this is the same possibilities that existed in the early church is possible for us now in our lives. We can live in the Spirit and in power now. When we go into these places, we are bringing the kingdom of God into that environment. And we are to operate with the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen? We don't apologize. Our kingdom comes down and shows people the way to Christ. Amen? So we need to believe for the miraculous this year. We're believing for loved ones coming in to serve alongside us. Amen? Can I get a witness? Yes. When we pattern our lives according to Jesus Christ, desire and passion for the salvation of souls, folks, we need to make this our hobby. We need to make this our first priority. We see open doors of possibility, open doors to speak the gospel, the good news, and to put it on full display. Jesus went everywhere healing the sick. I want to pray over people. Amen? When we go into these places, I want to enter into kingdom faith with you. Amen? We are getting ready to see the miraculous this year in 2024. And Titus 3, 3 through 4 says, For we once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various sinful desires, earthbound in other words, and pleasures, spending and wasting our life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another, you just got to turn on the news to see that. Amen? Yep. We know where we came from. If anything, the news will remind us. Right? But when the goodness and kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind 
appeared in human form in the man Jesus Christ. Why then the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember, John went saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's here. Amen. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it's at hand now. Amen. In us and through us. Verse 3 represents a graphic description of human depravity apart from Christ. This is a place we lived in apart from the acceptance of salvation and receiving Christ as our Savior. But no, things are different. We are in a different place. We're on a different plan, a plane of perspective, amen? But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, Paul's primary concern here is with a sinner experiencing God's grace. Amen? That they could experience his love too. That they could experience what he has for them. That he, they could experience that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen? The word used for love toward men in the Greek word, which is philanthropy, we hear about that a lot, but we never hear it from a rich perspective. It combines the thoughts of love, graciousness, and compassion, doesn't it? Love, graciousness. The title for God our Savior refers to God the Father, our Savior, in the sense that he sent his Son into the world as a sacrifice for sin. We're going to watch it. A movie not too long from now on a Sunday about Abraham's life, Nancy briefly mentioned. But can you imagine the things he went through behind the scene? We read briefly in Scripture, but what did he really face? What were the challenges he faced? What was he thinking as he was walking towards Mount Moriah and gave his own, he was willing to give his only begotten son that he waited to 100 years old to have. But yet, he still lived by faith. He kept his focus on God's kingdom. Amen? God sent his son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. Jesus Christ then sends us out as ambassadors for his kingdom into a corrupt world. You know, we're not to sit around song and sing songs about all wounded me. That it's all a hospital. No, at some point we got to move on to the kingdom. Amen? At some point we got to move past our experience on earth and say, I'm going to enter into the kingdom perspective. Amen? Amen? And so God sent his son for this purpose so that we would enter in. In 1st, 2nd Corinthians 5, 20, so that we, it says, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making his appeal through us. Can you imagine? He's making his appeal through us to the world. We are Christ's representatives plead with you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Not to go do a feeding program. No, be reconciled to God. We can do, we can feed, yes, but we better speak the gospel. We better talk, talk to him about the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's right now. And you can receive it today. Titus 3, 5 through 6, he saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we have once done, but because of his own compassion, his mercy is cleansing it of the new birth and spiritual transformation and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's a whole lot of words. But what happened is, it happened on the inside. Amen? It started changing on the inside. I started seeing things with God's perspective in a way that there was a regeneration, a transformation inside of me, a metamorphosis, similar to what a caterpillar. I used to be a caterpillar, but now I'm a butterfly for Christ. Amen? There was a change. There was a metamorphosis. I used to be crawling around, slithering on the ground. Amen? Just on the earthbound existence, trying to get by, wondering how I'm going to make it. But then, but then I started to see with a heavenly perspective. 
It wasn't about me anymore. It was no longer the me kingdom, which was not so good to begin with, if we're honest. But he poured it out richly upon us, amen? He did this and he poured it out richly upon us so we need to receive it. Our new birth is also spoken of renewing. The Spirit of God brings about a marvelous transformation. Not putting on new clothes on the old man, but putting a new man in clothes. You may dress this. I remember I used to be an insurance agent, right? Had my hair all trimmed and everything, all nice. Manicured the suit, everything. Okay? Sorry. An executive. Looked real clean outside. Suddenly I started doing the work of God. I started doing some street ministry and all kinds of things. And all of a sudden hair started growing out of places I never thought hair would grow out of. Sometimes you gotta look and maybe trim your ears a little bit. You know, here you are. And God says, you know what? He's got a sense of humor in life. He says, you know what? I could use that. That's pretty cool. You get to be an ambassador like that. But on the inside, it's all changed. Amen? But he uses some things. He doesn't take away your personality. Men that wrote the gospel, you can clearly tell their personality throughout the... the that's how they can tell. Paul wrote this. Paul wrote that. Paul wrote this. And sometimes they... I have controversy over Hebrews, but I think Paul wrote that. They talk all about that. But, you know, hey, you, you can see a person's personality in some things. Titus had a personality in a culture, but he used it for the glory and kingdom of God. You've got some uniqueness that God wants you to use. He gave you a fingerprint on your hand. We need to ask him how to use it, how he can speak through us, how we might lay hands on people, maybe. How we might share the kingdom of God. So the Holy Spirit enables us to walk as an ambassador. Put on garments of power. These garments are unstained by the corrupt world. If we allow our stuff, self to be stained by the world around us and what's going on, in particular, with this political environment that's about to happen instead of maintain our focus on what God wants to do through us? Why we let ourselves get stained by all the things around us? And God says, I want you to walk in power. I don't want you to be stained. So as we put on this new position, this new perspective, and start to walk differently, as if there's heavenly garments upon us and there's power flowing through us, these garments of power, these, these garments that are unstained by a corrupt world that relinquishes that perspective, says no more. That's how we put on the kingdom of God. Amen? That's how we put it on. We put on the kingdom of God in full display with his power and his authority. He says, behold, I've given you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and every work of the devil. But he says, you know, our warfare is in the spirit. It's not against who's doing this and who's doing that. They're just influenced by it, right? Our enemy is not walking around in the flesh. However, they can be influenced by it. He's given us keys and authority to unleash the kingdom of God and his presence on earth. He says in Matthew 16, 19, do you believe it? I gave you the keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind or forbid or declare improper and unlawful on earth, you have already been, has already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose or permit or declare lawful on earth has already been loosed in heaven. What he's saying is you can't just do anything. You've got to get the heavenly perspective, amen? Whatever you, whatever you say in my name, as my ambassadors, whatever you say, according to my word, 
He says, listen carefully. I've given you authority that you now possess to tread on serpents, to tread on scorpions, and the ability to exercise authority. That's what an ambassador does. He exercises authority on behalf of the kingdom over the power of the enemy, Satan, and nothing will in any way harm you. There was a time, there was a, uh, a young lady that came to see me. She was from the streets. And she was one of the worst of the worst at one time. And we used to ask her to follow us as we were carrying the, cro the cross. And she would fall into the shadows and the darkness and everything. Her name was Benita, right, Nancy? And we'd say, Benita, come on, follow, follow, come on, follow the cross. Come with us. Well, eventually, she started to come around. And she had a conversation with me, and she says, you know, Pastor, no matter what happens with you, when no, no matter what happens in the ministry, you need to walk out among the people. But know this, that God is with you, and no one, as long as you're doing his will, will ever be able to hurt you. No one will be able to to." to to stop God's purpose in your life. And so we began to walk out, and I remember one time we were at a motel, it was um, the Regis. We are at the Regis Motel on Colfax, okay? We're out there, and there's, we're knocking on a door, and all of a sudden we look around, there's nobody around in ministry but us at that moment. I don't know where they all went to. We were out with Main Street Ministries. We knock on a door, I turn around and look, and there's, gang members all in a courtyard. I'm like, this is a different perspective. So as soon as that door opened, we began to pray really loud. We turned around, and the gang members were gone, and God's people were back in the courtyard. And I'll never forget that experience, because that girl spoke into my life. And I remember, and you think, wow, God can use a mule to speak into somebody's life, okay? God can take a donkey to speak into Balak's life, run him into the side of a wall so to get his attention, and all of a sudden the animal starts to speak. That's in scripture. It's kind of odd. Don't expect that to happen all the time through your puppy or something. But <laughs> he, you know, so then we're, we're out there one time, and this guy comes up, and we're doing ministry, and it's about roughly the same place, and he comes up and he starts yelling at us, what do you think you're doing here? He's operating under a spirit of intimidation, right? He's, what do you think you're doing here? Do you think you're doing good? Do you think you're doing this? Do you think you're doing that? Big guy. And he's carrying on, and me and Nancy are just standing there. And then finally I said, don't you think it's time we should pray? And I grabbed his hand, and he goes, ah, oh, it hurts, it hurts. I wasn't even grabbing his hand hard. He kneels down, and he's literally almost crying. And then all the street people come and get him, and they said, you leave our pastor alone. And they drug him off. And I thought that, that the word that that girl spoke in my life flashed through in front of me again. Amen? So don't be afraid to do God's work in a place like Crete. Amen? Don't be afraid to be an ambassador for Christ. He will carry you through. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We are to recognize we're not powerless in a corrupt world. But our battle is not against people, but against wicked spirits that influence their actions. Amen? So let's review quickly. That uh, I put that up, I read that one, Nancy, about that. But let's review. The lives of believers in Christ are to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit, amen? Like one that is an authority, that we're seated in heavenly places. Christians are not in this world, are in this world, but not of it. The Lord says, my kingdom is not of this world, amen? And we're to pattern our lives after the desire and passion of Christ for souls. To see the open doors of the possibilities. To put the gospel on full display, Amen? God sent his son Jesus on our behalf. We're ambassadors of the kingdom. He says, I send you. 
Amen. I send you, I send you, I send you, I send you too. Amen. And you may think I'm unqualified. He didn't ask you for your resume, did he? He never asked you for your resume. We're to pattern our lives according to his desires. God sent his son Jesus Christ on our behalf. And he sends us out into a corrupt world to operate from a kingdom perspective. And we're to recognize that the Holy Spirit enables us to walk in these garments of power. He says, I'll give you the words to say when you come before men. Do you believe it? You can't operate in a spirit of intimidation. There are people that will try to intimidate you in this life. You've got to say, no. I've got a kingdom perspective. God said this. God said that I am an ambassador for Christ. I am not going to be intimidated. And we operate in that kingdom authority. Amen. We're to recognize we're not powerless in this corrupt world. We're to recognize that we walk under the authority and power of God and our, our battle is the Lord's and that we are dealing with spiritual wickedness, wickedness in high places. But these things that we think are so powerful, you know what? The devil's been disarmed by Christ. Amen. We, try, we give him too much credit. No, he says he's under your feet. He's under your feet. You can say the devil's out to get me. You know what? I'm continuing with the kingdom of God. That's what I'm doing. You can't stop me. You cannot stop me. I'm an ambassador. Let's pray. Pray with me today. Say, Lord, help me to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. I want to be an ambassador for the kingdom of God. I want your garments of power unstained by the world around me. I do not want to be influenced by this world, but instead minister to people with your love on full display. You know, sometimes we long for the past as Christians, amen? In Jesus' name. And you know this scripture that's up on the screen, and we put it up there in a monthly, and it's one to memorize, but there's also a condition with God's promises. And so this one says, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and confirm my covenant with you. So I'm going to confirm my kingdom with you, this covenant that I made with you. However, there's this fruit that you had in the past, okay? So you're to recognize, yeah, there was fruit in the past. And we eat that fruit, we remember that fruit. But he says, now there's new fruit. There's a new thing coming. And if you will embrace by faith what God wants to do, he says, then I will turn to you, make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant in you. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Amen. Let's worship the Lord one more time.